That one. Hello. There we go. Okay. Hi, I'm Jeff. Uh, welcome to Bay Piggies. We're the Bay Area Python Interest Group. And uh, welcome. If this is your first time, this group has uh, been around the Bay Area for many, many years. Uh, I, I don't remember when it started. The first meeting was Guido giving a talk. Uh, he's the inventor of Python. I think that was maybe 15 years ago or something like that. Anyway, uh, welcome. Uh, now we meet in LinkedIn. And tonight, Suman is going to give us a talk on Rockstore, which is a personal cloud system. And he's the founder of Rockstore Inc. and the creator of the open source project. So it should be a very interesting talk because it includes a lot of uh, Python components. And he can also talk about his experiences with a startup and with open source. Uh, Obviously, you know, uh, we're starting a little bit late tonight and we'll kind of move things slowly because of all the traffic from the uh, Shoreline concert. Um, usually there aren't Shoreline concerts, but I think uh, in the future what we'll try to do is uh, actually try to cross-reference and if there's a concert, we'll let you know in advance and maybe set up some kind of hackathon that night so it doesn't matter if you show up late or not. So, um, but I apologize uh, for this caught me off guard too. Um, but uh, now we know, now I'm reminded about that there is a amphitheater just next door. <laughs> anyway, uh, so I guess what, before we have the talk, usually we, ha we have an opportunity if anyone has any announcements or anything uh, they'd like to say to the group if you're like looking for a job, if you have a job you want to offer, anything, you can either borrow this mic or come up here if you'd like. Is there anything? Okay, I guess uh, guess we don't need to do that. Then we, 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 we can have another opportunity at, at the end, usually. So, um, and uh, you know, I, I think it's the other thing. So, I believe next week is when PyCon is. That's up in Portland, Oregon. So, a lot of people are heading up there already for that. So, that may be one reason for less attendance tonight. But um, this should be a really great talk. So, Suman, you want to come up and sure. get started? Have a hand for Suman. All right, um, thanks for coming. And um, I hope <laughs> more people will show up eventually. Uh, so maybe we'll take it a little slow. Um, I was looking at the um, you know number of people that said yes. I was like, oh man, I'm gonna be super nervous talking to this big group of people. So this is good in that sense. <laughs> so uh, my name is Suman Chakravartala. You can just call me Suman. Um, and uh, as Jeff mentioned, I've uh, started the Rockstar project about three years ago, and I want to talk to you about uh, you know anything and everything you're interested in uh, knowing. You can ask me. I'll uh, talk about uh, the Python centricness of the project uh, because Python is really at the core uh, of um, you know all the components. And um, yeah, we'll have. Q and A at the end, but you know, feel free to interrupt me anytime. Um, all right. All right. So first things first. Uh, that's our core repository on GitHub. Um, as you can see, we have about five thousand commits so far. So the project is still relatively young, and uh, we have twenty-eight tag releases so far. So we we did not do tagged releases until maybe about a year ago. Um, so um, every month or so we have one tagged re tag release. We call that a stable release. And uh, we also have rolling uh, sort of like nightly or maybe up to three uh, updates a week. 
uh, sort of thing, those we call uh, testing updates. And uh, this, this number uh, means a lot to me, 16 contributors, uh, because uh, three years ago, it was just me and a friend of mine who started this, and he was mostly working on the front-end side of things. I was working on the uh, back-end side of things. And we had, I mean, we have, we had some open source experience at the time, but we were very curious to uh, see, you know, how to handle uh, running an open source project. And we learned a lot along the way. And uh, I really like how it brought so many people together. And, you know, there are more contributors uh, coming every month or two. Um, so it's, it's a really good community that's uh, building up. And... Um, so we have a number of open issues, and we are a friendly community, so uh, please uh, feel free to join us and become a contributor. It's actually a lot easier than some of you uh, may um, imagine. So um, welcome. All right, so just want to highlight some of the project matters. Um, first and foremost, we wanted to do something that's open source, like. Uh, and actually, I should probably say free software uh, rather than open source. We were not uh, very concerned with uh, like the monetization or anything like that. We wanted it to be as uh, free as possible. So that's kind of like the uh, key um, aspect of the project. And since the beginning, it's always been uh, community focused. And uh, so Jeff asked me earlier, like, how, how I got the community going. Really, I, I had no idea. So we started open sourcing the code right from the beginning when it was like a very raw prototype, and nobody really cared. You know, when I first started it, I was like, oh, oh my god, should I push this code? Are people going to look at it and, you know, write, write me angry emails? And turns out nobody really cares. So it, it took a good uh, one year for people to start noticing it. And um, it kind of organically grew. Um, and uh, one thing that really helped uh, with uh, the community traction is the actual forum software that we use. Uh, we started using Discourse. Uh, prior, we were using some other uh, forum software, and it was really bad with... Uh, spam and all that stuff. But once we switched over to Discourse, um, it, it uh, attracted a lot of people and uh, made them stay and participate. And Rockstar is just software solution, so it's hardware agnostic. Um, you can, you know, a lo lot of people compare it to other existing solutions like uh, Synology and other things that you can buy out there, and they're all, um, you know, semi-hardware or something like FreeNAS, which is uh, pure software. So we are more like that. Uh, any hardware you can run Linux on, you, you can run Rockstar. And so Jeff introduced Rockstar as the personal uh, cloud server. Um, that, that has a nice, you know, <laughs> buzz to it. <laughs> but, but I don't think th that buzz is also anything new because, yeah, go ahead. Do you intend it to be uh, uh, to run uh, by itself on a server? Yeah. Okay. Dedicated server. So. Okay. Okay. So, do you intend for it to be uh, run on a dedicated dedicated server? Yes. That's just doing a rock star. Okay. Yeah, dedicated server or a virtual machine. A um, lo lot of our users run on virtual machines. I do um, development on virtual machines, but. Um, all the production stuff uh, runs on hardware. Yeah, so, um, but you can think of Rockstar as just a NAS server uh, with some advanced features. Um, so that, that NAS has been uh, there for a while, right? So that's a lot easier to imagine. And um, one of the goals is to make it really simple to install and manage. Um, and we use boring technology whenever possible. So, like, you don't, we don't have any React or, uh, you know, we don't have any components in Julia or anything like that. Um, and 
the last one is also really, really important to me uh, to make it contributor friendly because it's, um, I think uh, for, a project, for any open source project to kind of endure the test of time, um, it, you, you got to have a really good uh, community and the contributors have to be um, uh, treated well. And for a project like Rockstar, it's, it doesn't need a lot of contributors, but the ones that are actively working on it should, you know, have fun working on it. So that's pretty important. So the technology stack, so now we're getting into the, uh, you know, the core of this talk. Obviously, Python. Um, the entire backend is Python heavy, <clears throat> specifically Django and Django REST framework. So the um, backend is a REST um, endpoint. Um, so it's, it's like a web service, like any other web service. And we also use uh, ZeroMQ and G-Event for socket server. Uh, we use the Python request module quite a bit uh, because even <clears throat> in the backend, there are services talking to each other, and they're using the same RESTful API. Um, so for that, we use the Python request module. And on the front end, we have uh, JavaScript. Uh, we use Backbone. Um, so the lot of the UI, um, there is the mirror front end uh, component uh, that's uh, essentially Backbone. And we use all the usual um, libraries, D3 for all our widgets, and lots of jQuery. And templating, we use uh, handlebars. Um, in fact, uh, Priya, who is sitting over there, she's one of the contributors, uh, and she did a lot of uh, handlebar work. And Postgres is the database we use. So that's the technology stack. So again, uh, sales pitch, if anybody wants to contribute to Rockstar, and you are familiar with any of these technologies, uh, you should have no problem getting involved. Which version is Python? 2.7. Yeah. And Django, we are still in 1.6. And uh, I can talk about it a little later about the whole technical debt situation also. Uh, so um, in, any other questions? I, I thought I heard somebody here. All right, cool. So some feature highlights. I'm not going to spend too much time on this because you know I want to make it uh, more uh, Python centric, uh, but just want to give uh, people an idea of what the high level product features are. So uh, there's a lot of uh, ButterFS. You know we try to productize ButterFS features. You know ButterFS. Um, does everybody know ButterFS here? No. Okay. Um, but people are familiar with NAS. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, are people familiar with ZFS? Okay. So, uh, ButterFS is kind of like uh, ZFS, and there are some stark differences uh, when it comes to the design of it. And it's a very young file system, but it's copy on write and lots of uh, feature parity with ZFS. Um, so, you know, that's good enough for for this talk. Uh, but you can ask me questions now or later. You can uh, go into it deeper. So there are volume management features. So you throw throw a bunch of disk disk drives, and then you get to do a lot of things like RAID and you know uh, other things. Uh, so you don't need any hardware RAID, uh, just like uh, with ZFS. And uh, some things that are Unlike ZFS, uh, in my opinion, somewhat better is you can mix and match different drive sizes, and you have a lot of flexibility with like adding drives, growing your uh, pools go or, or volumes, um, changing RAID profiles online, so you can go from like RAID 1 to RAID 10 or RAID 5, et cetera. Um, and then there's some standard features like you know scrubbing the pool and defragmentation and resilvering or balance, as they call it. Uh, but keep in mind that it is still a relatively young file system. So another question that usually comes up is, is it production ready yet? Or is it stable enough and all that? Uh, we can get into it. Uh, but I'll, for now, I'll just say that it's, a, it's still a young file system. And then uh, there are also uh, copy on write features. Uh, I think this is this is why I've kind of chose uh, ButterFS. It was between ZFS 
Orbit RFS when I was building Rockstar. And uh, in fact, I had, um, I had some experience with uh, ZFS uh, because I wrote uh, a storage as a service, um, a web service based on uh, using Open Solaris platform with ZFS. So I was uh, very much impressed with ZFS. And then um, I went on to contribute to ZFS on Linux project a little bit. And so initially, I was going to go with ZFS, uh, but then uh, ButterFS is more promising, so I um, uh, switched. Um, so copy on write features. Um, so you have sub-volumes, snapshots, clones, and you can also uh, take diffs of uh, sub-volumes so you can reconstruct file systems. Um, again, this, this is more uh, like ButterFS rather than our project, because our project, we don't really uh, do any ButterFS development. Um, we kind of uh, use ButterFS uh, in an advanced fashion and try to uh, get involved with that community uh, to the extent possible. Uh, but that community moves really, really fast, and uh, they are you know, backed by a, you know, uh, corporations that have a lot of people working on it. Uh, so we kind of uh, don't really uh, do any ButterFS development. And another feature to highlight is um, I also built this um, application framework. Um, so you can uh, run Docker apps. Um, and uh, we actually call them Rockcons. <laughs> so these are any Docker containers uh, from the Docker Hub. Um, and there is like an app profile. You can create a JSON file, and you can run uh, most Docker apps. So I guess do a lot of you should be familiar with Docker, right? I guess everybody knows about Docker these days. Um, so like some of my favorite apps are uh, SyncThing. Uh, do you guys know SyncThing? It's like a file synchronization app. It's written in Golang, and it's, it's really nice. Um, and then OpenVPN. And Plex, a lot of home personal cloud users love this app. Um, in fact, I have a little demo video I can show. Uh, looks like we'll have plenty of time um, where I'll show how you can install Plex on uh, Rockstar in just a couple of minutes. And you can have your own private apps. Um, there is a generic app installation wizard, and it lets you install these apps, and then you can um, use them. Uh, you can also contribute those apps. It's just, most of the time, it's just a simple JSON file that you can open a pull request with, and uh, you can uh, give back to the community. And there are several other like advanced NAS features and regular NAS features. We don't really need to uh, get into them, but I uh, just wanted to highlight like uh, network teaming and you know smart. Um, actually, this is a good time to uh, plug one of the contributors. Um, uh, he implemented this uh, feature recently uh, for drive power down. Um, so a lot of home users, uh, even though they run these big boxes, uh, you know they want them to be as quiet as possible. So you can actually schedule um, your drives to power down. Um, you can also make them um, inactive. Um, there's like a whole uh, e easily configurable interface. Um, All right, now I'll just show a demo video. So I have a few demo videos. I'll just show this one first and then get into um, you know, uh, the architecture of it. And then if we have time, we'll come back to more demo videos. And so after the demo video, I'll explain how what you see kind of translates uh, you know, down from the UI to the back end and so on. All right? So just, uh, uh, but I'll stop the video and. Uh, 
All right, so if, once you log in, you get this dashboard. It's got all these uh, little widgets that inform you of various things like CPU usage, et cetera. And uh, make note of all the information here that kind of uh, gets dynamically populated. I'll, I'll talk about that. So dashboard has a few widgets. And then this is the main, uh, for this video, I'll just focus on, on, on this part, all the storage related features. So you have a bunch of disk drives, which you can pull them into pools and then carve them uh, into shares, which are like, you know, uh, directories. And then you can share them out uh, using any of those protocols. And replication is something I'll talk about later, but uh, it's basically a way to transfer uh, shares from one machine to the other. So you can just rescan to uh, attach drives online. Uh, you can configure a smart service. Uh, sorry, I, I intentionally uh, am making it go really, really fast. Uh, because if I, if I go through all the features, we won't have enough time. Um, but you can configure each drives. Um, so this is a virtual machine, so you don't have smart support. But there is a whole host of configuration there. Uh, for regular drives, and that's the um, disk uh, spin down uh, or power down that I was talking about earlier. Uh, so you can configure uh, like idle time prior, prior to spin down, um, and then there is more advanced uh, stuff. Oh, this is uh, this is to light up light up disk drives in a certain pattern, so you can identify which drive is what for labeling and replacing purposes. Yeah. No. This is just pure play ButterFS, BTRFS. Oh, you mean AutoFS to yeah. Uh, right. The there. Yes. So if I have a, a, a it's not possible to do that through the GUI, but you can do it through the command line. Yeah. Yeah. So Rockstar is a we. We create the entire Linux distribution. It's based on CentOS, uh, and you know you're not restricted in any way. So you can actually do a lot of configuration uh, on the command line, and some of that configuration the UI may not uh, detect it, but it doesn't go and overwrite it. So it'll play nicely with any of the customizations. Uh, do you plan to implement uh, iSCSI based volumes like your volumes and stuff like that? Mm, yeah. <laughs> yeah. If you look at our, uh, so we have an issue on GitHub, and if you look at it, there is a lot of plus ones for that one. <laughs> okay. I keep getting emails regularly about, oh, when are we going to have iSCSI and stuff like that. Um, so it, it's coming, uh, but there are some technical challenges there also. It may not be as, uh, you know, uh, good as we think it may be. <laughs> so. Um, and also a lot of iSCSI use cases you can use uh, NFS also these days. So, <laughs> yeah, there is an interesting discussion. <laughs> and then pools are basically write volumes, um, and you can just create them with a simple form. Um, select a bunch of drives. Uh, the drop-downs are not showing in the video demo, but there are a bunch of RAID options, there are compression options, and uh, stuff like that. So there you have created a uh, RAID volume with such and such compression. And you can edit stuff later. Size, what are the 
differences compared to the current solutions that you just mentioned, like Prinas and other solutions? So, so what, what are the, what's the secret sauce here? Sure. Well, first of all, we don't have any secret sauce because all of, all of our sauce is open sauce. <laughs> oh, I just want to highlight this. Um, so as I was saying earlier, you can change uh, raid levels of your pools online. That is something you can do uh, with um, ZFS-based solutions. And you can use drive sizes, uh, drives of different sizes. Um, so there is more agility with uh, volume management, yeah. But also some things that are missing would be like Z walls, you know, that kind of uh, features don't exist in ButterFS and they're not really, I don't think they're planned at all. And you can add more drives, you know, all of this online. I think this is what attracts a lot of uh, free NAS users. We do get a lot of free NAS and Synology converts, and uh, this is the feature they love the most, especially to the ability to use different drive sizes. And also when you, uh, when you add and rebalance, uh, it incorporates the new drive immediately, so you don't have a log, lag to rebuild the whole thing. Like AI can do, I, think, I see. I'm not familiar with that. IBM. Right, right. Yeah, I know about <laughs> So again, share is just a directory card out of uh, the pool. And the nice thing is you can have some attributes at the share level also. Like you can have different compression at the share level. Um, or you can inherit the compression uh, from the pool. Uh, so there's a lot of flexibility. And this is just us, and this is uh, resizing um, of the share. So it's kind of like Cortus, but uh, implemented natively in ButterFS. I've seen LZO and some other things that yeah, Zlib and LZO. Those are the only two compression algorithms supported. Snappy? Not yet. Not yet. Yeah. I think they have plans to add. Um, yeah, and you can take copy and write snapshots. That's what's going on here right now. You can actually clone them. Um, and here, yeah, I'm cloning a share. So all these are copy and write op uh, operations. So they don't, they happen instantly and they don't take any extra space. Um, And something to note is if you do go crazy with snapshots, uh, then there are serious performance implications. Uh, but you know, maybe a couple hundred snapshots uh, for each share is okay, uh, something like that. And you can also clone snapshots, so you can sort of like upgrade snapshots into their own uh, shares. Uh, I wanted to highlight something else here. Uh, but yeah, as I was saying, you can make snapshots into first-class citizens, uh, make them into their own shares. Uh, but this here, so there is, a, there is some sort of low-level error here, right? So we've, this is one of the things that our users really like, even though this is uh, not that fancy. When, when an error occurs, uh, we, we just give them you know, instructions to, uh, uh, you know, to send an email uh, to us, and you can just click there, and it'll just zip all the logs, you know, stack trace and all that. And at the beginning of the project, that was very, very useful for us, uh, because we can just see where the problem is. And typically what used to happen was, at the beginning, before we uh, started doing the tag releases, we had a very small user base, but they were really, really active, and they loved reporting problems. So. The day after we make the release, I get a few emails. And most of the time, those emails have nothing to do with the recent features. They're like old bugs, but they just found them. So it was, it was a great you know, symbiosis. Like we used to fix them and uh, you know, iterate fast. So, uh, but now I'm actually working towards changing that um, because we have different kinds of users now.
So here, what I'm doing is uh, rolling back a share to a certain snapshot. Uh, so if you have a bunch of snapshots, you can roll back the share in time, uh, basically. Yes. Yes. Actually, we have even fancier scheduling features, um, which I think will be towards the end of this video. Um, I'll talk about them when, uh, when it comes to that. But here I'm just randomly, you know, deleting stuff and uh, with shares and snapshots. So there. So you can create a snapshot, um, but most of the time users just schedule a snapshot. Yeah, so that's scheduling a snapshot. And as the video goes, just watch out what happens here. Uh, there is regular cron-like uh, scheduling, but there's also something fancy. So you give a maximum count so older snapshots get deleted. And then that's just, you know, regular cron-like scheduling. But if you, let's say, make it hourly, so for some sort of scheduling, like if you make it hourly, you can have, you can set the exact minute, and then you can have exclusion windows and inclusion windows. So here I'm saying run hourly, but only between Monday and Wednesday. So that sort of thing. Can you still have an hourly and then a daily separately? Yes. So uh, in our like docs, we also have some YouTube videos uh, where you can have uh, uh, multi, you know, layer snapshot, so you can have some hourly, some daily, some weekly, some monthly, and yearly. Um, so you can have that, that kind of scheme. And you can edit, obviously. So as you can see, there's a lot of CRUD operations going on, right? Um, deleting, creating, and then editing compression, editing the uh, stuff. So we'll talk about um, that next. I think this is it for this video. Um, all right. So I have a few other demo videos. Uh, if we have time, I'll run them. All right, so maybe th this is where we'll spend um, you know, as much time as we need to, and I encourage um, your questions. So this is the, the main architecture diagram. Is it, is it big enough uh, for folks? Or uh, I also have, um, let's see. This may be more readable, right? And I can zoom in also. Yeah. Okay, so here I've listed almost every component. I may have emitted one or two, uh, and how the how all these di different services and uh, layers interact with each other. So let's kind of go from top to bottom. Um, so at the top we have the UI, which is basically a, an app you access in the browser. And as I mentioned, um, it's a backbone application, right? So we have the backbone views, uh, backbone models, and backbone templates. So that's the front end MVC. I guess we're, we won't focus too much on that. We'll get to the Python side of things, uh, but if you uh, remember what you saw in the video earlier uh, with uh, you know table of disks or pools or shares, that's essentially a backbone view, right? And 
um, if you remember the dashboard, that's also a backbone view. So when you when the dashboard gets loaded, it's uh, you know making a few REST calls and fetching the information and displaying. Now you may have also noticed on the dashboard uh, that there is some real time uh, graphs, you know, CPU usage going up and down, right? So that is not through uh, REST calls. Um, it would be very inefficient. So for that, we use WebSockets. So some of the views that need updates from the server, like for instance, if there is if there is some sort of an error that server needs to just uh, you know push notification to, or if there is a software update, you'll see a little light bulb come up. Those sort of things are not um, REST API driven. They're uh, managed with uh, the socket server. So what happens is when you're on a certain view, like dashboard, uh, each widget, in fact, that is active, um, it subscribes, it registers a handler, and there is a socket server, which, you know, we use G event socket IO. Um, I, I see a nod in the back, so you're familiar with, with that library, but uh, yeah, so we use that library. Um, it's uh, not being maintained, so it's one of the uh, problems we need to solve soon. Uh, but luckily, there are some good solutions out there. So what happens is these handlers just uh, listen uh, for events. So that goes through, uh, you know, we have Nginx layer here, and there is a socket IO route, and that directly goes to socket server. And whenever there is a listener on a certain uh, channel, uh, there is one or more G event threads, or you know they are uh, piping the data to the front end, right? So that's how we handle the uh, real time uh, information. And when you first log in. So Jeff asked me earlier about are we using Django templates or not. So we are using Django templates, uh, but most of it is backbone uh, driven. Um, so backend mostly is a, um, a web service with uh, REST API um, endpoints. Um, but when you first log in or when you first set up, for instance, when you install Rockstore for the first time and you go to the uh, to the IP address in the browser, there is a you know, little setup screen, and you just uh, fill in a few things. So that and login, uh, just a few uh, views, they are driven by Django templates. And once you log in and you get that home screen of dashboard, um, that's when the JavaScript, CSS uh, assets, and the templates are downloaded. Uh, they are served um, from that static route um, uh, via Nginx. So that has nothing to do with... Uh, our main um, uh, Django um, or the DRF. Okay, so now that's how we use the Django templates very minimally, and the rest is all um, using uh, um, handlebar templates, and it's more in, on the front end. And when it comes to back end, we're just making API calls and uh, uh, getting response, and then taking that response and uh, doing stuff. Uh, with backbone. So, if you imagine the disks or pools or shares, they're all resources in the backend. So, in the Django, so this is this is the Django land, this this entire area. So we have our Django models, um, and we we almost. We have like almost one-to-one -one mapping between backbone models and collections to Django models, right? So you have uh, backbone models are simply URLs that are going to uh, Django, uh, Django models or uh, or the API endpoints for disks, pools, services, what have you, everything. So um, as you're you know navigating to different screens there are different API calls being made, and they go through Nginx to G-Unicorn or to API views. And for that, we use Django REST framework. Um, and 
so where does all the um, low level, you know, domain level logic happen? So some of it happens um, in the API views. We have mixins um, uh, that different views uh, share, but we also like to separate as much as possible um, because there is no point in uh, you know putting all that code in the views. So like we deal with a lot of uh, Linux user land tools. So for example, ButterFS progs there. So this is all uh, user land tools here above the Linux kernel and ButterFS, which is part of Linux. Um, so ButterFS progs, for example, is like a main user land tool we use to create a pool, which is a ButterFS file system, create a share, which is a ButterFS subvolume, et cetera. So we have some domain logic layer, which is also written in Python. And uh, that just uh, sits between the views and uh, uh, the actual user land tools. All right. OK, so most, most screens on the UI go through the same pattern, OK? Uh, so there is nothing much to, um, like if you look at our source code, you'll see backbone views, backbone model going to a certain URL, and then a bunch of uh, uh, Django code, right? Now, we have other services also um, within the backend. One I already talked about, which is the uh, socket server, but there are a couple others. One is the uh, ZTaskD or a 0MQ based task daemon. It's an independent service. It's also based on a um, an open source project. I think it's the project itself is called uh, Django ZTaskD, right? So I think anybody who um, coded in Django um, knows that it's a synchronous framework, though there are some recent um, changes that will let you do some stuff asynchronously. And the, uh, the main way to make it asynchronous, I guess, in a web service environment is to use Celery or some sort of message queue, right? Now, if you imagine Rockstar, which could be running on a simple, you know, I even run uh, Rockstar on Raspberry Pi, right? So Using those kind of technologies on your own uh, personal servers is, is a bit too much, you know. Even like Postgres, switching over to Postgres was a major decision, you know. I wanted to keep everything in SQLite, uh, and I did for like a year and a half. Um, so there is a clear diagram coming up. Uh, but I guess for now, I'll just say that for long-running jobs, so for instance, if you, if you submit a scrub job, scrub could take hours, sometimes even weeks if your pool is really large. Um, so what we do is we just uh, make the administrative state change and the response comes back um, and then updates along the way. Um, as to how much percent is done and all that is handled by this Z-test daemon. And I've used, uh, I've programmed using 0MQ uh, for a while before I started Rockstar, so I was like, the first chance I got to use 0MQ, I'm on it. <laughs> um, so it, it's a very lightweight, uh, you know, message queue is uh, what's happening here. And so, the key thing is the Unix socket, so it's listening on this socket, and when an API calls come, uh, call comes, uh, it's uh, you know submitting a job through this Unix socket, and this service is also a Django app, so it has some models um, in the database, so that's how. Um, it maintains its state and it has its own retry logic and stuff like that. That itself is a small but uh, fascinating uh, piece of software. 
All right, the other service is the replication, uh, replication daemon. Actually, uh, pretty involved, so I'll just kind of uh, give you a high level overview. So the replication feature in Rockstar uh, lets you transfer the contents of a share from one machine to the other efficiently. So it's kind of like rsync. Um, and those of you that know ZFS, ZFS has send receive, and uh, ButterFS has send receive. It's almost the same um, feature. So what it does is, let's say you have you have a share, and you take a snapshot, and you can take diffs between snapshots, and then you can send the diff over to another machine, and you can reconstruct uh, the share. So you can see how. Um, that is more efficient than something like rsync, right? And also, it has uh, some other advantages. Um, so for for the replication daemon, also I've used uh, zero MQ uh, because zero MQ is really really fast uh, with data transfer, and also uh, you can use a lot of patterns uh, to pipe data and send signals between uh, services. Um, so. For the, uh, let me just zoom in here. So to the to the right here, that's our replication daemon, and just like other services, it also uses the API via G Unicorn. So I guess these days they're calling it microservices or whatever, uh, but uh, it's service oriented. Uh, so. A lot of um, headaches with uh, sharing state and all that um, are solved by design if you uh, implement things this way, right? Um, so, for instance, there is a there is a listener which has a port open uh, for remote connections, so that it it also acts as a broker. So when a stream of uh, data is coming from another roster machine, uh, it can uh, take that and then send it to receiver. So it's sort of like a, you know, uh, it can handle multiple streams of receivers, um, multiple streams of data, and it just forks um, a receiver. And there is, there is logic there uh, to see how many receivers to fork and when not to and to queue and all that kind of stuff. And it, it's really, uh, using 0MQ makes it really easy to implement something really complicated like that. So I really like that and wanted to highlight that. And we, use, we also use OAuth um, as an authentication mechanism uh, from uh, like one Rockstar appliance to the other. Um, so as part of setting up replication, you need to um, basically exchange keys between the machines, and then they use those keys to talk to each other. Are you planning to have some sort of automatic high availability there, or it's more like just for transfer from one machine to another? No, just for transfer. Yes. I think for HA, I've looked into some things, and like others in the community are looking into it more actively. Uh, there may, there are different ideas, you know. Uh, yeah, yeah, definitely. Okay, I think that's pretty much it for the architecture diagram. Any any questions? Yeah. Well, maybe this is early, but how much code is in the Python layer? How many lines of code roughly are you going to get into that? Uh, we can take a look right now. What's that? Oh, yeah. So the question is how much code is Python and how much is something else? Um, so we have 72.2% of the code is in Python. So it's still, it's Python heavy. And is it straight Python or are you using something like Cython for performance? No, just Python, yeah. Yeah, actually, some uh, some stuff like um, maybe with uh, replication um, and others, we we can definitely use uh, more performance. Yeah. 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 Yeah
So I don't know if Python is the <laughs> so, all of these services are exposed in the services tab. So, most of them you get, you, you see that they stopped and you can turn them on. So, like there are some other services that I don't uh, list here. There is like a bootstrap service uh, and a few others. Um, and the main Rockstar service, obviously, if that goes down, if Nginx goes down, then you don't have the web UI. Uh, but you can restart it from the CLI. But for any other services, you can manage them from the web UI. Yeah. All right. Any other questions? Yeah. All of them. <laughs> yeah, all of them. Yes. 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 Uh, yeah. So I went over that um, earlier. So I actually did a major refactor of that. So. Uh, the initial implementation for like the first year and a half of it was this f over complicated, over engineered fan out uh, way where you can have one source replicated to uh, multiple targets. But it turned out nobody really uses it that way. And even if you do, uh, things get out of sync. So you don't really save anything. Uh, like, unless you do. Uh, fancy buffering and stuff, and at that point you're using a lot of RAM. Uh, so I did a major refactor, and right now uh, there is no fan out, uh, but if you, if you replicate a share to two different targets, unfortunately it is uh, two streams on the network. Uh, yeah. But at least, um, the, they, they do share the uh, uh, snapshot diffs when possible. Um, so it's a, you know, it, there's scope for improvements though. And I have a question about the, the technology itself. You use uh, ButterFS and Receive? Yeah. Yes. So you use ButterFS and Receive. <laughs> I uh, started using that technology for a few years ago at least. And uh, ButterFS works really well, but uh, at the kernel level, uh, ButterFS has having some some issues, especially with some receive. Uh, so depending what you do and how you do it, basically the the send the data itself is not is not able to to be decompressed. Uh, have you experienced these things? And I don't yes. know how is the state right now. Yeah, actually, we have a couple of open issues. Um, we have a couple of open issues about that also. Um, so another thing I noticed is that uh, send receive was working well and then there was a regression. So this kind of pattern happens in ButterFS, especially because we stay on like one of the latest kernels. Like right now we are running 454 and pretty soon we'll switch to 455 and so on, right? So we, we take that risk. Um, and yeah, um, there are a couple of issues open about that. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm hoping that, well, so I've been doing this for three years, right? And I do see that we have taken many steps forward and then a few regressions. So I have no doubt that, you know, in, in some time it's gonna be fine. All right. Uh, I just want to highlight a few more things um, and uh, and wrap it up for questions. So state synchronization is uh, is a problem. Um, so the approach we take is first of all, what, what is the problem? The problem is you have system state that may change on its own, or you may have an admin go and create 
ButterFS file systems and snapshots and stuff uh, with CLI. And at the beginning, we had this problem where um, things go out of sync. But we have simplified it by uh, eventually syncing up the actual operational state with the administrative state. Um, based on what actions the user takes and what some other services may be doing. So it's sort of asynchronous, um, and also it doesn't interfere with uh, if you want to really uh, do things manually. Uh, and it applies to other things also, like uh, network configuration and so on. And I think I've already explained about uh, zero MQ. We I try to use it as much as possible, and it uh, it, it the results are amazing. Um, so for long-running jobs, um, it works great. So the apps that I mentioned, and I'll, I'll show the video, um, we use 0MQ that kind of goes on its own and uh, installs the app, re retries it if necessary, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, it updates the state using the API. Um, and we had, so for asynchronous replication of shares, ButterFS and receive, on top of that, we use 0MQ to send the uh, bits and do all kinds of uh, metadata um, checking and whatnot. And we also had system tab probes a while ago. And I've removed it because there doesn't seem to be any interest. And, uh, but, you know, if anybody, if anybody is uh, interested in uh, or is, is a system, is into system tab, uh, please talk to me or get involved. Uh, I think there is a, a potential there to um, show some good storage analytics and other information. Okay, so just one quick slide on the um, long-running jobs. So this is how it works. So when an API request comes, let's, let's pick a long-running job, such as uh, a scrub, scrubbing a pool. So when a request comes in, it goes to the Django view, and we just dispatch a job, and then send the response back saying, okay, scrub has started, or it, it failed, etc." And then if the job is dispatched properly, the Ztask uh, manager, um, it executes the task, and it has its own uh, state machine, and then it updates, it updates uh, our main app using an API request. Uh, so it's as if uh, it's another service. And then the UI, which is somewhere here, um, can request again to see if uh, Scrub has proceeded and what percentage is it finished, etc. Um, I think I've already talked about this. I'm just going to highlight that when it comes to asynchronous replication, there is so much work uh, still to be done. And, uh, you know, anybody willing to join the community, please, please do. Uh, it, it, is, it is a fun feature to work on. And I think I've covered this way at the beginning. Um, so for real-time updates on the UI and pushing notifications, uh, we use a socket server. Okay, so any any questions? Yeah. One question about the zero MQ. Yeah. Um, do you use like uh, the standard patterns, or do you have to kind of create your own patterns uh, if if you have to? Do you think any of this is uh, possible open source as a separate patterns? So I use at first I used this fan out pattern that was uh, zero MQs. Uh, I think based on their dealer uh, pattern. But now what I do is, um, it's, it is a standard pattern, but it's a compound pattern. So you have, I think, um, uh, two peer-to-peer, -peer, and then the broker in between. And then the broker to peers is, um, I forget uh, exactly what it is, but it's not, it's not a, I think all the simple patterns, they've already, uh, you know, accounted for. So I just put together a few other patterns and created this compound pattern. Okay, so um, so the first year or so of Rockstar was just like me and my friend Suji just 
you know, doing stuff and overthinking and, you know, talking to a bunch of people who don't really, uh, you know, who weren't really into open source or anything like that. And we were kind of like, you know, feeling pretty lonely. Uh, but, so it was fun and frustrating, but it's always, it was always educational. You know, we were always like learning something new. Uh, so that's what kept us going. And, you know, like I've always had this idea of like being part of this uh, free and open source software community is, you know, something cool, right? And finally, uh, you participate in that ecosystem, and you meet your uh, your tribesmen one way or the other, and it's uh, it's very very rewarding. Um, so like I have, so there is one contributor, Phil, uh, who uh, I have no idea who this person is. I haven't met him yet. I'm looking forward to, but he's in the UK, and he just emailed me one fine day saying, hey, you know, I wanted something like this for a long time. Um, and he started using it, started uh, contributing to the documentation, and then he's like, you know what, uh, how about this pull request? And I'm like, yeah, it's, it's welcome. And now he is uh, he's a big contributor. He implemented the uh, power down feature, the UPS support, and a bunch of other stuff. And he is an active member in our, uh, in our forum, for example. And we have another contributor just like him um, recently from Italy. And he's the one that um, implemented uh, scheduling with uh, inclusion exclusion stuff. Uh, so he did that, and he did another thing that uh, I can show later uh, for like downloading logs and reading logs on the UI, uh, that sort of thing. So it's it's really nice. Uh, so that part is uh, very rewarding. We have, I think, we have about 700 people on our forum. And I hope after today we'll have uh, some more. <laughs> and um, even though it's a small number compared to some other, like let's say, free NAS community or whatever, our community is uh, very, very active. So all these, all these folks uh, really uh, are active. And we have frequent updates. I don't think we have time to go over uh, release management stuff, but we use Python heavily for that. Um, I, you know, I'm releasing testing updates uh, every couple of days, and it's nothing but you know a couple of buttons. Uh, we use Jenkins, and uh, I use build out, which is like a really lean way of uh, doing stuff. And uh, most importantly of all, like I've learned to be like resourceful. Like I have no idea that I had to do a lot of things that I ended up uh, you know learning to do uh, besides uh, just coding. Because when you're when you're an independent contributor on a project at a company, uh, life is so much uh, so nice, you know. Uh, but here you have to deal with a lot of things. Like you know, like any minute now I could have a problem. Like our forum may go down, and I'm running it from you know on Rockstar obviously because you know I believe in dog fooding, and it's running in my apartment, so it could go down for any number of reasons, <laughs> you know. So. Uh, it's uh, it's adventures. All right. Um, anybody listening to KQED here? All right. So pledge drive is going on at KQED. I think it's still going on. So um, is it going at uh, Rockstar as well? <laughs> so this is how you can give back. Become a user, uh, and even if you're like, you know, we get a lot of users that are not coders, but they know so much about Linux and ButterFS, and that really helps us uh, quite a bit. Um, and you can contribute code. Like, you can look at our code. It's pretty readable. You know, we've gotten, like, drive-by contributions quite a bit. And I usually, uh, I'm very accommodating. You know, if, if it's not really that uh, complete, I either suggest or make changes myself, but my goal is to merge every pull request. Um, so it's a pretty friendly community. And yeah, you can also get on stable updates, buy subscription, um, you can buy support, and you can also buy things like, like this one right here. Okay, n not exactly this one, but... <laughs> um, and right from the UI, you can uh, PayPal us some money. Okay, and if you if you PayPal, my phone is gonna ring, and it's it's not doing anything right now. 
But that assumes that we can get it installed and up and running with no problem. Yeah, you know, the, that shows, uh, you know, my marketing skills, right? Like, in order for you to give me money, you have to invest so much time. <laughs> you know, not good. <laughs> so, yeah, um, I guess that's about it. So, questions, please. Yeah. Could you compare to, could you compare to other similar projects? Um, I guess FreeNAS is the big one, and is it similar in some ways to own cloud? I don't know much about own cloud. Or what are, what are the things out there, and how does it compare? Sure. Um, so FreeNAS is definitely a you know apples to apples comparison. It's based on ZFS and FreeBSD, whereas this is Linux and BTRFS. And I went over some of the you know, uh, distinctions when it comes to volume management. So there are differences in features. Um, and I, I believe that, uh, well, I don't have to believe this, but Linux community is a lot more active, bigger. Um, so improvements to ButterFS and not just ButterFS, right? We also use other components of Linux um, and we'll use them increasingly so. And uh, it's a good bet on Linux community rather than a free BSD community. Um, but as a user, if you're just comparing features, there are a lot of similarities. Um, uh, uh, my users tell me that our UI is better, uh, but some of my users also tell me that, you know, hey, is it production ready? Uh, I don't think so. <laughs> so, yeah. Yes. So after seeing that, uh system diagram, it looks like a pretty complicated system. So how do you go about testing that? One, one could imagine you would need a, a whole other community and set of code even more complicated than that just to test it. Yeah, that's a very good question, right? Um, we, have some, we have some unit tests and we keep writing them um, regularly, uh, but we have a lot to catch up. I'm not too worried about the UI tests. Uh, we do have some of them. Actually, Priya wrote a bunch of that stuff uh, some time ago. But I'm more worried about uh, you know the backend stuff. Um, so we need to write a lot more tests. Uh, but I don't think it is that complicated because I try to reuse patterns and I severely dislike. Uh, introducing new complexity, and I've actually learned to decrease complexity because even before I started Rockstar, I used to be uh, saying, oh, you know, let's not reuse, uh, let's not uh, invent something new and that sort of thing, but only after working on Rockstar, I realized how easy it is to just, you know, get blindsided and um, over-engineer things, so, yeah. Another question. So, so you mentioned at one point that you had to switch from uh, uh, one database to another. And can you elaborate a little more the reasons for that and, and how that worked and so on? Sure, sure. Um, so, you know, I wanted to keep it really lean because, you know, this is running on your own server. And if you do a top or whatever, you shouldn't see a bunch of Rockstar services taking up all the resources, right? So at first it was all SQLite. But then we, we needed multiple databases uh, because we have the smart manager component um, that runs, well, it's deprecated now, but it used to run system tab probes, um, all that uh, kind of stuff. And we needed synchronization, which SQLite supported uh, to a good extent, but uh, we, uh, you know, we ended up having issues with the write ahead log and basically we had some synchronous issues. Now, I am actually open to switching from Postgres to SQLite now because the Rockstar stack itself um, is more simplified. For example, if we, if we are not going to do analytics, we, we, put, we put that on hold anyway. So if I think analytics is gonna be, it can be a good, a good feature if there is demand. 
But if we are never going to do that, then we may not even need uh, multiple databases and it's probably better to use, go back to SQLite and keep it lean. Yeah, uh, but the transition to Postgres was so smooth and you know we could just focus on development. We don't have to deal with debugging all these database issues. So uh, uh, that was um, helpful. How much memory do you recommend to uh, for a system to have to run Rockstore? Uh, not much. I you know I have machines with as little as uh, one gig um, running. Um, I think you know there is no magic that we do. It's just Linux. It runs uh, well uh, with low memory. Um, I think we can make um, some more improvements. Uh, performance improvements. However, I have to say, the UI runs in your browser. <laughs> so that does take up memory. So uh, the backend is uh, not so much. Yes? Did you consider using MongoDB? OK, the question is, did I consider using MongoDB? Um, I have some experience with MongoDB prior to Rockstar, and it wasn't really nice, uh, so I, I didn't. Uh, really consider that, and also I, I don't know. Um, I mean, SQLite was so much easier to get started with. So, yeah, like w one of the things um, to note about Rockstar is that even though it's like a web app with you know like st like if you if you if you take any software as a service uh, stack, there are a lot of commonalities, right? But since it runs in your own server, um, it's important to use as little and leaner technologies. Yes. Okay. Uh, what about the business side? Uh, do you have a business around it? Do you have customers? Are you making money? You think it'll be self-sustaining? Oh, I'm making so much money. I was going to send my assistant to give this talk. <laughs> <laughs> No, no. So, <laughs> so th that itself is is a big topic. Uh, you know, when we first started it, we thought, oh, you know, it's a startup, right? But you know, I don't think Rockstar fits the standard startup template. Uh, and I, I I realized that like maybe a year, year and a half into it, because we would go talk to these uh, like investor types, and they're like, what is the secret sauce? And that. They say things like intellectual property and all that, and I, I get so bored and like I just want to go back and start coding again. So, um, I I do think Rockstar is a, has a good business model, but that business model is good for Rockstar's users, the community, and for the team. It's not a good business model for investors. So, it can be it can be a you know. Good business. If there are some angels that want to visit me later, please do. <laughs> but it's not going to be like a VC play or anything like that. I don't think. Yeah, but we do have paid users now, so we we sell subscriptions for stable updates, and we have hundreds of subscriptions. And uh, there are some business users that have Rockstar, um, you know, in like. Uh, secondary or tertiary kind of pro uh, projects, and uh, you know, I, I offer a lot of free support, but then I, uh, you know, don't have that much time. So we introduced incident-based support. Um, I talked to the uh, other. Um, have you heard of PFSense uh, project? So they uh, they have this instance-based support. They're, they're like an open-source firewall product. And I talked to those guys, and uh, I've decided, okay, you know, we should do something like that. So we do get some uh, businesses paying for incident-based support. Um, yeah. But yeah. Yeah. Thank. Uh, I would have a quick question. You know, your your talk was advertised to be a cloud-based solution. So effectively, it's a NAS solution as of now. You don't do any deployments of, I don't know, containers, or do you have any plans of introducing such things, such as, I don't know, Docker containers or whatever other virtualization you would choose? Yeah, I'll, 
I'll answer you with this video. <laughs> The system. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, the, the cloud nature of Rockstar is basically the apps, right? That let you access Rockstar from anywhere, uh, you know. And uh, you'll see that here. So, I mentioned briefly about the app hosting framework in you know, Docker based apps. We call them Rockons. So, this short video will show you how you can install um, Plex on Rockstar. So you configure the Rockon service. Basically, you give it one share uh, to download any Docker images, et cetera, that it needs. You turn that service on. And then you go to the Rockon's page. You can also turn it on from this uh, place. But these are all the apps that are available. You can add your local apps. You can update and see if there are any new apps available. Um, so there are plenty of apps already. Uh, I think I'm going to pick Plex. <coughs> and this is how you, in, you install. So this is a generic wizard and configuration driven. So Plex needs two uh, shares. And you, know, you just fill out this form. Um, it has some defaults. And there are some tool tips with uh, you know, helpful information. Like, yeah, yeah. yeah, but this is all Docker based. So yeah, th that went so fast. But what's that? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it, it went pretty fast. But what it did was it it downloaded the Docker image, configured the container, blah blah blah, and all using that generic wizard. And then finally, it presented you with a simple switch to turn the app on or off, and then a little settings icon that will let you do some other things, like add more uh, share mappings, et cetera, and some info, and then a button to actually go to the app. So that's the settings. You can add more storage. So if you, if you have videos, and later if you have music, you can add, add, them later, add the music later. And then any info. This is all configuration driven. So you just create that JSON file for whatever app you want to use, and it picks it up. So there you go. So now I have Plex running on Rockstar as an app. So you can access this Plex uh, app from your phone from anywhere. Um, so I guess, you know, this is, this makes Rockstar, uh, That's the uh, yeah, yeah, it's yeah. cloud. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. You yes, indicated sir. that you have some paying subscribers. Could you say something about what those customers are actually doing with the product at this point in time? Yeah, so most of the paying subscribers are um, professional home users or prosumers. They, they really like the open source um, aspect of Rockstar. They want to have uh, complete control of their data and they want to you know, be able to trust. And they use... Um, apps heavily. Uh, some just use regular butterfish features. And what they're paying for is the monthly updates that are reasonably tested uh, within that release cycle. So they don't want to be uh, on the two cutting edge updates. Um, so they, you know, they want the testing updates to be vetted in the community and then they'll just get the monthly updates. So that's what they're paying for. Yeah, and we offer some free support um, for for these um, you know paying or subscribers. Um, so through like we have a little OS ticket and through email. Um, yeah, and the other kind of paying users are businesses that uh, pay per incident uh, for problems like you know they need help with installation or. Um, help recover some data or they have a ButterFS question, that sort of thing. Yeah. There are other services that we could potentially add. So how are you planning to take this forward? Um, what features do you have in mind? Do you want to add any new features to this? Yeah, yeah. So like at the 
beginning of the talk, I've um, showed um, like all the pending issues. There are some big features. There are some uh, little ones. Um, so we have 228 open issues. There are some big features like uh, you know hard data tracking with uh, some sort of caching. Uh, there's like the iSCSI support. Uh, there is the Hardspare support. There's a bunch of ButterFS things that will come along. Um, there are some more enterprise features like uh, HA, uh, clustering. You know, like so, so, uh, I find it very funny when somebody opened an issue saying, "Convert Rockstar into a clustered solution, one GitHub issue." <laughs> Just use Ceph and you know this and that, done, right? So th there are some re really big ones. There are some small ones. Um, so are, are you a developer? Yes. Okay. So you know you might want to take a look and see if uh, there's something interesting uh, for you. Yeah. Cool. Yes. Quick question. Do you have? Um S3 support at all, or a way to run like an S3 API, because that'd be nice for testing. And so, the, yeah, there is one rock on called Duplicati. So it's basically the Duplicati app uh, running on Rockstar, which you can uh, use to uh, back up shares to S3. Yeah. Hi, I'm not sure if uh, you covered this earlier because I came in a little late. Sure. Um, but from a security standpoint, how do you handle uh, data on disk? Are you doing encryption inside Rockstore? Are you relying on the system to do it, the user to do in their own encryption? Uh, and how are you dealing with um, uh, data movement? So like um, access to or access restrictions to like different parts of the system. Right. So encryption of actual data in the pools and shares, um, we have a pending issue for that. I think the only solution we can do, uh, we can implement right now is um, Lux, I think it's called. So I think we may actually get to that very, very soon. Um, so that's uh, that'll at least uh, bring disk level encryption. Um, we don't have any like share level encryption. I don't know if there are any solutions that will uh, let us implement it without any side effects. Um, regarding just the Rockstar software security, as it is like, you know, there are so many services and all of that, right? Um, we use Unix sockets and not TCP sockets for like services that are just on the same machine. And for replication, um, for communication between machines, um, we use like an OAuth based, um, and it's also the web UI itself is um, you know uh, TLS. And um, let's see what else. Um, and the sharing protocols, you know, like NFS, Samba, SFTB, you know, we don't really do anything there. It's just, you know, um, yeah. I think if we do the disk level encryption, that's a big step forward. Thanks for that question. Uh, what licenses are you using? GPL. I'm sorry? It's not really free stuff. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> okay. Right. Sure. Yeah, it is. Um, that is true. Yes. Um, suppose this uh, idea really clicks. What are your plans for scaling it up, like in terms of memory and servers? I was not here um, initially. I yeah, think no, that's late, fine. So. Um, so you mean like um, scaling it to multiple servers? Well, I guess for this particular talk, I guess we are focusing on the personal 
uh, server uh, use case. And though there are some cluster uh, type features that may happen in the future, um, for so we don't have any uh, that kind of scaling issues to worry about. Yeah, but I'm sure there are things that I don't know yet. <laughs> Sorry, I, I wasn't here in the beginning because of the traffic. I, nobody uh, was here in the beginning. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah. It's pretty bad out there. Um, what distributions do you uh, recommend? Oh, so we... I see, I see a bone too there. <laughs> well, this is just my laptop. And recently I haven't been happy with Ubuntu. Uh, but Rockstar... Even though um, you can install it, technically speaking, with some effort on any distribution, we actually package it into a, its own distribution, which is based on CentOS. Um, however, we um, distribute with a more recent kernel. So it's CentOS for all packages except for the kernel. Which do you use and why? So we use, we, uh, have you heard of the L repo project? Yeah, so we use a L repo kernel, which is basically one of the later kernels with CentOS or RHEL uh, configuration, and they make these RPMs available. Um, I try to pick something either the latest or one or two behind. So like, on my machines, um, really unstable ones, I have like the latest one running. After running it for a few weeks or so, I put, um, you know, if it meets some criteria, I'll put it on the testing channel. And then the others in community are so much better than me, like vetting that kernel, and, and they do that. And if that goes well, we'll roll it out to stable. Yeah, but it is a, it is a turbulent uh, aspect of Rockstar, actually, because uh, like we've we've been having issues um, with running Rockstar on USB, um, running off of USB, for example, and uh, all the recent kernels are um, you know giving problems. Yeah, since it's a software-only solution, it's kind of hard to assure that it runs on all hardware, um, you know, especially when you're dealing with cutting-edge kernel. Yeah. Uh, does it work well running off uh, virtualization? Yeah. Yeah, it does. So I think um, there are a lot of uh, installations based on pro on Proxmox and then uh, VMware. I I I don't run anything um, like production uh, type stuff on virtual machines. Um, but a lot of services I run, for example, our forum is a rock on, hosted on, Rockstore running on a small hardware box. And the update server is basically an Apache uh, rock on. Um, Jenkins is another rock on. So these are all like Docker containers running uh, on top of the Rockstore platform. Uh, but Rockstar itself, I don't, I don't run it on VM except for development. I use VirtualBox, and um, but in our community, there are people, a lot of people running on either um, VMware or Proxmox. I think, yeah. Going twice. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Thanks for... Uh... Well, uh, thanks a lot. That was a great talk. I learned a lot, and I think I'll give it a shot and try it out myself. So um, does uh, anyone have any questions or announcements or anything before we go? Come on up and... Thanks, Jeff. Uh, thanks, Simon, for presenting today. Uh, my name is Paulo Santana. I'm one of the managers here. 
at LinkedIn. Uh, thanks so much for coming with uh, all the traffic. Actually, last week we had the Google I.O. <laughs> so this, this week we have the cure. So, uh, but uh, I mean, I guess we're going to try to coordinate that better uh, for next time. Uh, just like to uh, let you guys know that we do a lot of Python here at LinkedIn and we have opening jobs and we have two other engineers in the back if you want to chat with us some of the stuff they do, Josh and Zvezza over there. Uh, with some previous engineers that used to work with us over there as well. Um, I'm also available to, if you guys want to chat a little more. Okay, and welcome again to LinkedIn. Thank you. Yes, I, we should thank LinkedIn for hosting us. It's been always been very great for us, so in spite of the cure, but uh, I won't hold it against them. No, I, so I, you know, I apologize. I guess I uh, didn't realize that was happening tonight. So I think what we'll do is, is uh, Glenn and I will kind of cross-reference the uh, Shoreline Amphitheater schedule. And if we see something happening, what we'll probably do is schedule, you know, like a hackathon or something where, you know, you can just come if you can or not, right? And where it doesn't matter if you're late. So we'll do that in the future. But uh, really appreciate everyone braving the traffic to get out here, though. Uh, speaking of which, uh, what are our prospects of being able to get out tonight? <laughs> Doesn't the Cure give pretty long concerts? Cool. Let's all try test that out. <laughs> okay. And uh, next month, uh, Glenn uh, Jarvis will be back, and he's going to give a talk on Git and Python. So, like, I think he's using some Python APIs to Git to show the, how the Git internals work and stuff. Okay. Thanks a lot, everyone. Good night.